Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. Today's special guest is Hannah Redlick, who is currently living in Northern California. Hannah, good to have you on. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I have seen a number of your, I'm going to call them vignettes, Irish dancing vignettes that's been on Facebook. I've seen them on social media. I've seen them on YouTube. Uh, and, and I've been very intrigued. And I wanted to have you come on and talk about uh, what got you into producing those, those videos and a little bit about your Irish dancing background and what you're doing with the both of your Irish dancing and your film work. And we'll talk about that as the interview goes on. So, but, but let's sort of set a genesis of all this. How did you get started on Irish dancing? Who are your teachers? Well, like many uh, dancers of my generation, river dance captured me at a young age. Um, I was born in 95, so it was just coming out when I was born, and I loved it. I don't even think I was really aware of my Irish ancestry or my connection um, to Irish dance, but I just knew that it was it was calling me in some way. And my parents, not knowing that that was even something you could learn in the U.S., you know, um, enrolled me in some some tap and ballet classes at our local YMCA, hoping that that might appease me, but it didn't. <laughs> I can distinctly remember being in a ballet class thinking, this isn't river dance. <laughs> um, but one St. Patrick's Day, we were at an event downtown in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there was a parade going on and this beautiful team of dancers came leaping through the parade and that was Sandra Connick school. I studied under Sandra Connick. At the time I was enrolled, it was called Rink and a Heron. Um, and I studied there for my entire time dancing for, that was when I was seven or eight. Uh, so I've been Irish dancing now for over 20 years, which is kind of hard to admit. <laughs> okay. And, and so how did you make the transition from uh, that part of America over to the, over to the West Coast? Well, Irish dancing is kind of indirectly involved. Um, some of my, my videos were noticed by bands, and so my sister and I were invited to perform with the band called Judah and the Lion in Nashville, Tennessee. And while I was there, I befriended another band um, and kind of got connected to them through social media, and that led me to an internship out in L.A. Um, for a company that was looking for videographers. And the reason that they wanted me is because they saw my dance videos on YouTube. So it's all Irish dancing has always been kind of intertwined with my filmmaking and my career and has really led me a lot of places. Okay. So, so going back to your, your days dancing with Sandra over then um, the East coast of, of America, talk about some of the experiences that you had, maybe some memories that, that you carry with you to this day, as far as like, you know, classroom memories or performances or competitions and how involved you got in all that. Yeah, um, you know, I think one thing that really stands out to me about the school I was a part of and something I become much more appreciative of as I get older is just how supported I felt the entire time I was at that school. Um, so I did compete. I competed for about 10 years and I was really supported through my competition years. Um, but, you know, I feshes are a huge financial investment um, and time investment. And so we didn't always have the capability to invest as much financially as some other families did. And I just remember how supported I was through that, you know, through scholarships or through getting to borrow dresses or never, never feeling pressured to buy dresses or, um, you know, they supported me in where I wanted to invest my time and my efforts. And later on in my career, I kind of decided that competition wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. And I really found a love for performance and they su supported me there too. You know, I think there was a part of me that kind of feared if I said I didn't want to do fetches anymore, that I might not get as much attention in the classroom. And that never happened. I always felt really supported even when I transitioned into, into performance. I can see that. I can see where I hate to say it, but the female dancers have a, a much more difficult time than us guys. You know, when I was competing back, I was competing right after you started, like in the late nineties through maybe the mid two thousands. And we would go put on our Sunday best, you know, some slacks and a dress shirt and a tie, maybe a vest, you know, the vest came in style later and that was it. And I always looked at the, you know, the ladies over there and the young ladies and the adults and et cetera, that were buying all these expensive dresses. And I thought we really do have it pretty good <laughs> compared to what you guys had to go through. Uh, and, and that the cost can be, is even today of people talk about how prohibitive it, 
how prohibitive it can be uh, to Irish dancers. So it's good that you were still able to, to participate and uh, be worked into that and enjoy that part of Irish dancing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel so, so fortunate with the, the school that we found. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, if, if I really wanted to be a world champion and I would have gone to my parents and was like, this is what I want to do full time. I'm sure my, my family would have found a way to make that work. But I really had other interests in Irish dance. And so it wasn't necessarily important to me to participate in in the pageantry of it right <laughs> um and so i i do feel really fortunate that you know i never felt pressured to do that okay now speaking of of experiences you had both in competition and outside of it what were some of the highlights maybe of, of your competitive career and also your highlights of, of the performances you started getting involved with over there at the school yeah um so I did, I competed until I got into Open Champion. And I think that that's really, you know, even though now I really find a passion for, for performance, I'm so thankful for my competitive years. I really felt like that accelerated my dancing and really um, made me the dancer that I am today. And so I have so many memories. You know, our school had a great community environment. I remember all of the girls that were in my age group that I would compete with, we were all friends and we all got along really well and we all supported each other when one of us placed really well. And, you know, I don't want to take that for granted because I know that sometimes that family community environment isn't present in a competitive atmosphere. And so I love that, you know, I have great memories of being at Feshes with my friends and, um, you know, our, our eight hand teams, we, we were big Kaylee school. We love doing the Kaylee dances. And so I have some really great, great memories of the friendships that we forged through through competitive Irish dance. Um, and then, you know, it really sparked my interest in performance was actually a show called Enduring Love that I was a part of. Um, and our school participated in in a in a show. And that was I was probably about 15 or 16. And that was the first time I'd ever performed on stage. And I just immediately recognized that that was my calling. That's what I love doing. I'm a very creative person. And so I loved working on choreography and telling a story through dance. And I hadn't really had the chance to do that in the competitive sphere. You know, there's less, less opportunity for kind of your own artistry and expression. Um, in the competitive sphere, besides things like trouble reel competitions or dance dramas or things like that. And that was never really the focus of my my competition. So that just awakened me to a whole new arena of what Irish dance can be. And I immediately fell in love with it. Okay. So you were talking about performing. You talked about a calling. Would you would you say that there's an element of, of maybe personal belief and faith intertwined with your dancing? and giving you that purpose to uh, perform and entertain, not just entertain, but enriching people who are, are looking at you exude the talents that you clearly have. Oh, certainly. Um, you know, even with my dance videos, the ideas kind of came to me in a way that I felt like was beyond my own creativity and beyond my own vision. And I really felt like I was supposed to be making them. And maybe that was you know, to get me contact, to bring me out to California to work in the film industry. I don't, you know, I don't know what the purpose of that calling was entirely, but I definitely felt like there was a vision beyond my own that was propelling me to make things like that. And, you know, even now I own a production company up in Northern California and my partner, Isaiah Metters, who I work with is Native American. And so we do a lot of work here with indigenous communities on cultural preservation, um, intergenerational trauma healing and land rematriation. And it's so funny, you don't feel like all of these life experiences are gonna relate to each other, but they always, they always end up being intertwined somehow. And so I was at an indigenous event one day and someone asked me what my ethnic background was. And I shared that I was Irish and Scottish and they said, oh, well, you know, us Native American people, we really feel like the Irish are our brothers. We, yeah. you know, we have a shared history and we feel like we're kindred spirits with the Irish people through the, the cultural oppression and the genocide and forced labor and all these things, but also, you know, the resilience, the resilience of culture to survive and people to thrive through those events. And 
it suddenly struck me that this might be my purpose coming together in this way that I would have never anticipated. Mm -hmm. And so now having seen how important cultural practices are for indigenous communities in terms of intergenerational trauma healing, connection to their music, their dance, their language is so healing. And so now I'm reframing my relationship with Irish dance from a perspective of healing. You know, it's it's more than just something fun to do. It's more than just something that we do so it's not forgotten. It really can be healing. And so now um, that's really reframed my my view of what Irish dancing can be. And I feel like that certainly it's all been I feel like divinely orchestrated in some way. Some sometimes I look back at how I got here, and it just it feels unreal, you know. Hmm. Okay. And so, going back to the the event, the Irish dancing videos that you've produced, where did that idea come from? Was that just from the fountainhead of the performances that you started doing when you were fifteen or sixteen, and you took that interest? It was that did that kind of start everything that would lead into these videos, or did that just come uh, come upon you the idea? come upon you later on yeah i think i think my first video there are definitely some videos out there that are a little embarrassing now <laughs> oh. um, you know i made when i was a kid and just i was learning the mechanics of how cameras worked and how editing softwares worked and of course i chose irish dance as my subject matter because that was my other love um and so i have a few videos out there that you know are just was my experimentation with how dance and film could come together um, but my first video that really got some recognition was my Irish dance to a Hamilton song. Right. A song from Hamilton, the musical. And that was one of those ideas that I, I felt like I had to make. Like it was beyond me. I was being told I needed to make this video. Um, and that just kind of came about, you know, Hamilton that year was huge. If you were in the U.S., you knew about Hamilton, the mu musical. And... I remember I was carpooling to dance practice in my friend's car and she's like, have you heard this? They're telling the, the history of America um, through rap and hip hop. And, you know, one of the things I think I relate to most in Irish dancing is the percussive element. Mm -hmm. So when I'm hearing a song that's inspiring to me that I really enjoy, I'm hearing the beats in my head. I'm hearing which beats I might accentuate um, or which ones I would mimic or which one, you know, where I would maybe fill in beats. And um, so I was listening to the Hamilton soundtrack and I could just, I could hear it in that song, in that Guns and Ship song. I could hear what I wanted my feet to do. Um, so I called up my friend. I performed at a, a venue called Lotta Plantation, which is a historical site in North Carolina. And I said, hey, I have this idea. Um, would you mind if I just like threw down a dance board outside one of the colonial buildings and and made this video and he's like i'll let you inside of one and um so that's how that was born and, and that made it the video a hundred times better so um i appreciate him letting me do some damage to their floors <laughs> yeah i was wondering about that i didn't know the setting i didn't it, you know you wouldn't know that looking from the outside what kind of building or, or house it could be and it could be in an old you know early 20th century tea shop with that wood floor like that. But it, that's really neat that you were able to go into a building like that. And they would let you, as you say, uh, do a little damage to the floor for the purpose of, of the arts. So uh, that's very good. Now, how long did a video like that take for you to produce? Yeah, so it, it took a few weeks of choreography. I remember uh, teaching a dance workshop. And then at the end of it, I stayed a little later in the studio and was working through some of the choreography. Um, and then we shot it in one day. I, I really enjoy storyboarding and making sure everything's planned out so that when you're in the stress of a, a film shoot, it can be done relatively cleanly. Um, so we shot it in an afternoon and then I edited it in a few days. Um, and I remember feeling like I needed to get it out quickly. I was thinking, surely someone else is thinking of this. I got to get this out. Someone else is going to do it before I can. Um, so I, I shot it and I wanted to reshoot it. Actually, I wasn't 100% satisfied with it. Um, but I decided I just needed to get it out there and stop being such a perfectionist. So I, I released it and, um, I was so, so excited about all the support it got. Hmm. Okay. Now you talk about wanting to redo parts of it with any video, not just that video. What do you find are, are most of the things that you want to redo in, in videos that you've shot? Is it just changing the angles or is it the audio wasn't good or what, did, what do you think about that? Yeah, it always feels like filming is such a whirlwind. You're always on a time constraint, whether it's 
lighting, the sun's going down, whatever. Um, and so sometimes you're just kind of forced to rush through things. Um, and I also, you know, one of the things I really love with my videos is finding unique and visually stimulating locations, but those aren't always the best dance environments. <laughs> so one video I'm dancing on some rocks and um, other, you know, usually my boards on some kind of unlevel platform. And so sometimes I'm like, oh, if I would have just had a flat surface, I might have done this a little better, you know, so there's just always things that you become kind of hypercritical of yourself. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that I really love about my videos, too, is that I try to construct some kind of story. And so sometimes the culmination of, of the dancing and the story and the cinematography hopefully all comes together. And those little things that, you know, stick out so much to me as, as the editor might not stick out to other people. <laughs> okay. Now, going back and looking at some of the videos when I was prepping for the interview, you haven't made some in a while. Is that correct? That's correct. I When I got out to California, I lost my team. My my dad and my mom and my sister were all the ones who would go out and help me film okay. and, you know, got distracted with work and um, then launched my own company with my partner. And so things have gotten busy. But, you know, it's funny that you you reached out to me when you did because I just had started the choreography phase of a new project that I'm, I'm hoping to film soon. So it's, it's calling me back. What is it about the, the performance and the dancing that's calling you back? Yeah, I think that it's, it's part of my cultural identity. There's still part of me that hears a fiddle um, and just gets excited about it. You know, it just kind of wakes something up in me. And of course, dancing is an expression of that music. And so it's, you know, I, I connected with some local musicians here in Northern California. There's definitely not as large of a Irish community in California, but the people who are involved in it are very involved and very passionate about it. And so I was able to connect with some other um, people who share a love of Irish culture and that reawakened something for me. And I think um, as I was expressing earlier, learning that about the native indigenous community here and wanting to assist them in telling their cultural stories has really reawakened um, an interest in my cultural heritage. And so I think just a culmination of, of all of those things have come together. And, you know, with the pandemic, I, I took a, I would still dance here and there, try to not lose my shape entirely, you know, but it was enough time for me to miss it. And so I'm excited to be coming back to it. Well, uh, when will that video drop, do you think? <laughs> uh, my goal my goal is to have it before St. Patrick's Day. That's always a good goal for Irish dance videos. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Will that be released on, on YouTube or, or some of your other, all of your other social media channels? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Well, I look forward to, to seeing that video when it comes out. And um, can you give us any hints on what the themes are? Or no? Or is that top secret? Uh, it's a little secret. I will say it's inspired by some Celtic mythology. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Well, that's good. Now, when you're not uh, dancing and you're not creating the Irish dancing videos, which, which like you said a minute ago, you haven't done it in a little bit of time. Um, are there interests out, other, outside of Irish dancing that you participate in as well? Yeah, I... I'm an artist. I love art in every capacity. So I, I'm a visual artist. Um, I do some writing. And my, my main work recently has been documentaries. And so that's been a really, really rewarding work for me to do. Um, I, I definitely feel like that is, is my calling, is to help tell stories and help preserve stories. Um, and, you know, I, I recognize how powerful art is in shaping culture. I think that's what really stood out to me about filmmaking when I was a teenager, first becoming interested in it, was that, you know, they say art is a reflection of culture, but I think oftentimes culture reflects art. And so I wanted to be part of an industry that really had an impact globally, hopefully in a positive way. Um, and I kind of take that approach with all of my artistic endeavors. You know, I I act a lot on inspiration, but every time I'm creating something, I'm thinking, what is the message? What, um, who's going to be hearing this? What could this mean to someone? And so that's really compelling for me as an artist. 
I've posted some of the uh, the information on your social media, uh, various channels on the banner here, and I will, I will put a couple of things out there on the description side of, of this this interview. But I certainly appreciate you coming on and telling us a little bit about some of your projects and where some of these really cool projects in the past came from. And I uh, can't wait to see what you've got coming up in the future. Best of luck to you for the, all that. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this.